So, okay, I, I just want to welcome Rabbi Shulman. He needs no welcome, and you all know him, but I just really, I want to thank him for all the wonderful teaching, and I haven't even sent him all the comments that some people sent me on here. I sent some on this class on, on Kohelet, so it's really a, a pleasure. This will be a shorter series on the Gilat Ruth, and then uh, we'll take it from there after Yontif, and uh, thank you, Rabbi Shulman, Vakashai, you only have five weeks, but there are only four chapters, so I... Hopefully, no, we're yeah. not going to. We're going to get and get to it all, but we're all going to do the best we can. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you very much to all of the, uh, the all of you who are joining us uh, today for our study of Megillat Ruth. Uh, I just posted the source page on the chat. I'm going to actually just sort of uh, post it again. It's a long source page. Don't uh, don't be over. Don't be uh, intimidated by it. Uh, we'll get to it piece by piece. And if, uh, if I could trouble somebody to just keep an eye on the chat, so if anybody jumps in and asks for the source page, you can just repost that link. That will be helpful to me. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and share my screen. A couple of pieces of housekeeping. Number one, if you can um, keep your cameras on, it helps me. Even if I'm sharing my screen, I see all of you because I have two monitors so I can see uh, all of you even through the shear and I will try to leave some time at the end for questions a lot to cover so I uh, if I don't get to all the questions or to the questions at the end of the shear I'm always on the call 15 minutes before the next shear so you are uh, always welcome to join us uh, 10 15 minutes before the shear starts at a quarter to two um, and then uh, kind of have an open mic chance to catch up on questions. All right, so I am going to share my screen. We're going to jump right in. We are at study of Megillat Ruth is our topic for today. They've changed Zoom on me again. So Zoom now looks different, feels different. I don't know, they keep changing it. Does everybody see this screen? Yes. Thumbs up. Excellent. All right. So we're going to start here. Perak Aleph. Vayhi bimei shvot ha-shoftim. In the days of the judges. Uh, we'll get to the Midrashic definition of uh, judges judging or judging of the judges, but for now, bimei shvot ha-shoftim simply means the days of the judges. Vayhi ra'av ba'aretz. There was a famine in the land. Vayelech ish mi bet lechem Yehuda lagur b'ste mohav. A man from Bethlehem of Yehuda went to sojourn in the fields of Moab, who ishto ushnevana, together with his wife and two sons. ish Elimelech, Veshem ishto Naomi, Veshem shnevana of Machlon Bechilion Ephratim, mi Bethlehem. Family now has names. The Pasuk Aleph didn't have names, but now it has names. Ali Melech, his wife Naomi, two sons, Machlon and Chilion, Ephratim, meaning from the tribe of Ephraim, living in Bethlehem, or from the tribe of Judah, if living in Ephrat, it's unclear, but for now we'll leave it. Vayavo, Sede Moab, Vayusha. And they went to the fields of Moab, and there they remained. Vayamot Elimelech Ish Naomi. Elimelech Naomi's husband dies. A very odd way to identify Elimelech, by the way. Um, clearly, the the heroine of the story or the central personality of the story is going to be Naomi, and so Elimelech, who dies here, is identified as Naomi's husband. Vatisha'er he ushne vanea, and now she is left widowed with her two sons. Two sons married Moabite women, by the name of Orpah and Ruth, and there they dwelt for 10 years. They also died. And so by the time the story is over, Vatisha'er, just going to momentarily put background noise on mute. And so she remained bereft both of her two children and her husband. Until finally, 
So finally, she and her daughters-in-law got up to return from the fields of Moab. Because she heard in the Moab that she heard that God had remembered his people and provided them food, bread, but essentially the famine was over. It's so kind of a little bit of a play on words. So therefore they returned to Beit Lechem. Beit Lechem the city, Lechem being the central motif of, of the famine. But in all cases, she left there. And the rest of the story from Pasuk Zion and on, we will get to at another stage. For today, my focus is on these opening six psukim. There's a lot that's not said. There isn't a lot of background. Who's Elimelech? What time period are we living in? What is uh, the context here? Why, and most importantly for our purposes, why does God chase after them? Why is it that Elimelech dies and then Machlon and Nechilion die? Why is all of this tragedy taking place in the context of the very opening verses. We don't know anything about them. We don't know what they've done. That We don't know what their background is. And yet, suddenly, uh, head of the household dies. The two children die. Uh, the, there is a uh, substan... There is a... Um, you know, she's left bereft. And uh, the tragedy here is the central motif of this whole introduction. Vatisha er he... Uh, where's the Pasuk? Um, ha'isha mishne um and she is left bereft of both her children and her husband. Really extraordinary. And she has no other children, as we'll see later on. Uh, really an extraordinary uh, moment. Um, and the assumption is in the world of Tanakh, in, in, in contemporary life, you could argue that such a tragedy is, is somewhat could be theoretically random in the sense that we don't necessarily know why this tragedy occurs. In the world of Tanakh, it doesn't operate that way. In the world of Tanakh, if there's a tragedy of this proportion, there needs to be some context in which we understand why this takes place. And that's really the question we're going to try to explore today. From the, Is there a hint in the text itself or in the context of, the, of Sefer Migilat Rut, as to why this is occurring, but it's certainly perceived as something which is God's hand against Elimelech and against the family, maybe even against Naomi, unclear, but certainly Naomi herself sees this as the hand of God against her, and we see that by the end of the parak. When she finally returns to Bethlehem, and she comes to Beit Lechem, and all of the people of Beit Lechem come out to greet her. She together with Ruth. She comes to Beit Lechem, and the entire city is overwhelmed. They're in an uproar. And they proclaim, This is Naomi? Whoa. What happened? She says, Don't call me Naomi. Krenali Mara, call me bitter. Naomi, for the word Naim, pleasant. Now she's changing her name to Mara. Ki heimar shadayli me'od, because God has treated me bitterly. I left full, came back empty. Whether that's a function of financial reflection or more likely family. She went to the husband and two sons. She came back both a widow and a she lost both her sons and her husband. Why call me Naomi? God has afflicted me. God has done evil to me. And so she has, there is this moment of bitterness that's reflected in this context of the fate that has, in a sense, pursued and plagued this household. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves, and that's a question that all the Mephoshim struggle with, the Midrashim struggle with, essentially, to put it simply, what was Elimelech's chet, or Maslan Nechilin, what was the family's crime to which this was their punishment? The assumption that there is, in fact, such a crime. That's question number one, the big question. There are a number of additional smaller questions, both linguistic and, and technical. Um, 
including the Ra'av, what role this Ra'av is playing in the story, and uh, the fact that he, they went to Moab, why is that significant? Uh, we'll get to the whole story of Ruth and the conversion of Ruth and the relationship with Ruth. That will all be part of our study of the next couple of weeks. And then, of course, the bigger question, which is, uh, why is this the Megillah that we read on Shavuot? Uh, for that, we're not going to address today at all, uh, but we will get to Bezrat Hashem down the line. So we have our work cut out for ourselves. Okay, we ready for the journey? Hands, hands up, we're ready for the journey? Good? All right, let's do it. So for here, we're going to jump to the source page for a moment. And... Um, so you can ignore the beginning, a little bit of a chiastic structure to the opening verses, not our issue for now. Uh, Chazal certainly saw Machlan, Chil, and Elimelech all as individuals for whom this chait was something, or this punishment was something which was appropriate, or, you know, the, uh, as they say, uh, that they deserved. Uh, Chazal do so by playing on the words of their names. The names Machla Mechilion, Chazal, and a number of Midrashic sources play out the notion that Machlon and Chilion come from the words Klaya, Hulin, Nimchum in Olam, phrases that mean that they were either uh, profane or that they were worthy of destruction, Klaya, Kilion, that they were wiped out of the world, Nimchum in Olam, Machlon all reflected, reflecting the idea that they not just, they didn't just die, but they fact this was a punishment from the hand of God. And that's really the beginning of the, of the Sefer. What is going on? So Rashi will introduce us to what I would call the classic approach to, uh, to Elimelech. And the classic approach, which is articulated in the Gemara and Baba Batra, Ve'elech Ish, the opening verse, a wealthy man went from the uh, from his house and from his place in Beit Lechem to Sde Moav. Ashir Gadolaya Ufarnas Hador. He was great, very wealthy. He was one of the leaders of the generation. Vietzam Eret Yisrael Luchutz Laretz, and he left the land of Israel at a time of distress and famine. Mipnet Saruta Ayin. Because he was stingy, self selfish. Shaita inot sarab aniim habaim lidochko lachach neenash. Because he was stingy, he didn't want to deal with the poor people who came to pressure him. He had so much wealth and so much money, but he, everybody was knocking on his door. On his door, it's a time of famine. There's no food, so they came to him for help, and there was only so much he was prepared to put up with. And so he says, "You know what? I've had enough. I'm going." decides, looks on the map, says, okay, Moab looks like a nice place to go and live. We're going to go and live in Moab. Why Moab? For another conversation. A little bit later, maybe even today. But that's where it starts. Similarly, the Gemara in Baba Basra makes this assertion. The Gemara discusses it in a very interesting halachic context, which is, are you allowed to leave the land of Israel? If you live in the land of Israel, are you allowed to leave, to live somewhere else? It's a whole fascinating halachic discussion. And the Gemara there starts with the assertion that a person is, should not leave the land of Israel to go to Chutz Laaretz, unless there are certain mitigating circumstances, such as there's a famine, uh, there's no there's, there's no ability to earn a parnasa or to learn Torah, or to get married, there are certain exceptions to that rule. And then the Gemara says that even though we said that there is, a, if in a case, for example, of a of, of inflation, runaway inflation that makes it impossible to, to uh, earn a living, that you're allowed to go to Chutzlar, it says the Gemara, Hayabra Bishrim ben Yechai Omer, Elimelech machlon v'chilyon g'dolei ador hayu, Elimelech machlon v'chilyon were the leaders of their generation, they were wealthy leaders of the congregation. Why were they punished? Because they were in the land of Israel and they left to go outside it. And then it quotes the verses that I showed you earlier, Hazot Naomi, that uh, this is what happened to Naomi when she left to go to Chutzlaretz and eventually she returns. Why should just picking himself up and leaving and going to Chutzarts be such a 
terrible thing to do that would literally make it so that uh, God runs after them and, and destroys the entire family in Karet style, a husband dies and the two children die. Uh, so to add just one piece of the story, it's not just that he was wealthy, not just that he was a leader, and we'll have to figure out who Elimelech was and why this is the case, but the, Gemara, the, the Medrash adds one piece to it. And the Medrash says, nash Elimelech, why was Elimelech punished? Al yidei shehipil liban she Yisrael alehem. Because he, dis, he caused the hearts of Israel to sink. Meaning, it wasn't just that he left and he went to Chutzarts, but that he was a leader, he was looked up to, he was a person of stature. And when he left, he essentially created a sense of despair amongst the people that he left behind. He turned their backs on them. He ran away. He didn't want responsibility. He didn't want them to be left with all of this care for others. We'll see a little bit in a few uh, weeks as we go through the rest of the Sefer. We'll see that there's a major theme of Megillat Rut that has to do with chesed, kindness. And Elimelech is almost the antithesis of that sense of kindness. He literally turns his back on his people at a moment of critical need. And because of that, that moment where there's a famine and there's a need and there's distress, and he picks himself up and he goes away. So there's essentially two elements here. One is leaving the land of Israel. That in itself is considered a problematic chait for which he is punished. And the Medrash adds the component that there's also a social element in this chait. Not only does he himself leave the land of Israel, which by in itself is problematic, but he also kind of discourages or causes despair amongst the rest of the people of Bethlehem as he does. Okay. That's more or less the, uh, the, the context of this opening position, which is that his chait revolves around leaving the land of Israel. The truth is that uh, as we begin to explore the Sefer, one of the things that we're going to see over and over again is that Megillat Rut does not stand in a vacuum. Megillat Rut stands at the, epi- at the at the sort of the head of a triangle of three major moments in biblical history. And those three moments are essentially the moments that create the union of what will eventually be the end of the Megillah, namely the union of Rut and Boaz. The entire book sort of focuses us on the series of events that leads to the union of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz, who comes from the house of Judah, and we'll see where in the house of Judah, and Ruth, who comes from the story of Moab, and birth of Moab from the union of Lot and his daughters after the tragic, after the destruction of Sodom and Amor. The notion that there is this kind of intersection of Ruth with these other stories is evident in two major ways. Number one, Ruth is referred to throughout the Megillah with very rare exception. She's referred to constantly as Ruth HaMoavia, which constantly reminds us, takes us back to the world of the birth of Moab and who, where her roots lie. And that will become a, a theme we will explore. And the other is in Perak Dalit, at the end of the Megillah, Perak Dalit, actually, you know what, let me show this to you in the text of the Megillah itself. After Boaz and, I'm assuming everybody knows the basic story. I'm, I'm, I haven't am i read through the basic story because I'm just assuming it's so familiar to us. One of, those, one of the most beautiful and, and well-known books in Tanakh. And my goal here is to kind of unpack it, but I'm assuming everybody knows the basic story. But if we look at this, that when but Ruth and Boaz marry at the end of the book, the people of Bethlehem come to them and give them a bracha. They give them a blessing. What's the blessing? And all the people of the gate and the elders said, Edim, you are wit- we are witnesses. That what? May God make this woman 
to you, bless her, that she should be like Rachel and Leah, who built the tribes of Israel. That, in a sense, in a moment, we'll see this much later in the text, but this is a sort of a public recognition of her status, her conversion to the people of Israel. Very important piece. And then, May your household be like the house of Peretz born to Yuda and Tamar. Yuda and how do we get to Yuda and Tamar of all places? Yuda and Tamar embrace it, and suddenly that's the reference here that the household should be like the house of Tamar and, and Yuda. And the truth is that that notion is the story itself. This book ends with Eilat Toldot Peretz. The book is the story of the descendants of Peretz. Peretz, son of Yudan and Tamar, gave birth to Chetzron, and uh, Chetzron only the Dram, and Ram and Minadav, and Minadav at Nachshon, famous Nachshon ben Minadav, Nachshon only the Tzama, someone only the Boaz, Boaz only the Oved, Oved only the Yishai, Yishai only the David. So the whole story revolves around Yudan and Tamar and that union that led to the birth of Peretz, and from Peretz came Boaz. And on the other hand, the other story in Bereshit that is of connection is the story of Ruth, born from, or descendant of Moab, born from Lot and his daughters. So from the very beginning of the text, we, or in context, we now have three stories that are going to serve as a kind of a triangle for us. Why is that significant? Because the three stories that we're talking about, Ruth, or Elimelech, I should say, Lot and his daughters, Yehuda and Tamar, all three of these stories actually share a same context. They share the same tragedy. In all three of these stories, you have the death of the husband or the wife, meaning the head of the household. You have a widower, widower remaining. You have two children involved. Both children die, and the spouses have to, or spouse, has to rebuild the family in a way that is Yibum-esque. We'll talk about Yibum later in our study. Right? That's certainly the story of Ruth. You have death of Elimelech, Machlon and Echion, the two sons, and then the two daughters-in-law, one who leaves and eventually leaves everything on the shoulders of Ruth, the daughter-in-law, to rebuild the family. Okay, The genders here switch, male and female, but essentially that's the structure. Yudan and Tamar, you have the same story. Yudan marries Batshua, uh, who is a Knanit. She dies. Er and Onan, the two sons, also die. Yehuda refuses to allow Tamar, the daughter-in-law, to rebuild the family, and so Tamar takes that initiative. We'll talk about that at the end of, of Perikimo. And Lot and his daughters are also fascinating because Lot is a story of Lot who comes to the people of Sodom. Again, the context we're going to moment in a moment we're going to look at in detail. Mrs. Lot, right, Lot's wife, dies. She's from Sodom. Right? Lot doesn't when Lot leaves to go to Sodom, he is not married. Right? Lot leaves Sodom many years later. He has a whole family. He says, his wife dies. The text tells us that the sons in law, who were also from Sodom, remained behind and they themselves were killed in the destruction of Sodom. And only the daughters came out with Lot. And those daughters had to rebuild. And so you have the birth of Ammon and Moab. And so the context of this destruction of the family of Elimelech, the destruction of the family of Judah, and the destruction of the family of Lot, in all three cases are exactly the same structure, exactly the same tragedy. There's almost an argument to be made that if you have three stories in Tanakh that have the same structure and the same depth of tragedy and the same structure of tragedy, maybe they share the same chait. And that's really where it gets fascinating. That, I think, is at the heart of why Chazal points to the Chait as being leaving the land of Israel. Because in, in a certain sense, both by Lot and by Yehuda, you have that moment where the prime protagonist of the story, Lot in this case, Yehuda in this case, 
leave the, the Jewish people, leave the land of Israel, leave their, the, the community of Israel for reasons which we'll explore in a moment, and God punishes them, in a sense, uh, by the destruction of the family. So you have almost exactly the same kind of structure of chait as well as onish. So let's take a look at that for a moment, and, and then we'll, I want to, just to kind of fill in this piece, is what this is about. In the case of Lot, Lot's a fascinating story, and why? Because Lot's story is the birth of Moab, and we're going to come back to this over and over again through our study of the text. But I want to take us into the world of Breshit Yud Gimel, the moment Lot chooses to go to Sodom. Lot's decision to abandon Abraham and go to, to Sodom doesn't happen in a vacuum. We go to Breshit Perik Yud Gimel, and just start from the beginning, Avraham comes down to the land of Israel. Actually, we can go back one parak to Perak Bet for a second. God says to Avraham, go to the land of Israel, go to the land that I will show you, I will bless you, etc. Avraham takes his people, takes his family, and he, at the age of 75, he goes to the land of Israel, and he gets there. What happens? Right? Lot is with him, his nephew. He gets to the land of Israel, and instead, Immediately, by he Ra'av Ba'aretz. Sound familiar? Right? There's a famine. Same, right? By Migilat Ruth, it also it says, Vahi Ra'av Ba'aretz, there's a famine. Where does Abraham go when there's a famine? Well, if there's a famine in the land of Israel, typically, what causes it? Typically, famine in the land of Israel is caused by a drought. No rain. No rain. Caused by a drought. If there's no rain, you want to go to somewhere where there is water. So where is there always water despite the fact that there's a drought and there's no rain? Egypt, because Egypt is is a water source is the Nile. It's a very major theme in Chumash altogether that Egypt doesn't look to the heavens for their source of life, meaning water. They look to the Nile River. Whereas in the land of Israel, we look to the heavens because for us it's about rain and about God who provides the rain. But they, but Abraham comes to the land of Israel and he goes down to Mitzrayim. It's a fascinating machloka between Rashi and the Ramban. Why, whether Abraham was right in going down to Egypt, according to Rashi, he was being tested in his faith. Comes to the land of Israel and God says to him, "Go down to Egypt." So he goes down to Egypt, and he doesn't question God. The Ramban, on the other hand, says, and I'll show you this source, Ramban says of, of Abraham's decision to go down to Egypt, Abraham's decision to go down to Egypt to abandon the land of Israel at a time of famine Note, parallel to Eli Melech, Abraham's decision to go down to each at a time of famine, says the Ramban, was considered a great sin, a great mistake, because God sent him to the land of Israel, and God expected him to remain there. God will save him even from famine, if that is what God wants him, where God wants him to be. In a certain sense, there's a proof from the text that the Ramban is right, that Abraham's sojourn in Israel was supposed to remain in Israel, and instead he went down to Egypt, because he goes down to Egypt. How long does he stay in Egypt? How long is he there? In total, how long could he have possibly been in Egypt? Couldn't have been in Egypt more than maybe a week or two? How long did it take from the time he gets down there until Paro's men identify Sarah and bring Sarah to Paro? By Paro. Maybe Paro's, one day. Maybe, maybe one maybe day. A day. Maybe a day. Maybe a night. Right? That's it. And then they're smitten. God smites Paro in his household. And, and uh, finally he turns to Abba and he says, what is this? And Abba makes an excuse, whatever the context is. And Paro immediately takes Abraham and his family and he sends him away. He says, you can't stay here. So he comes down to Egypt. He's there for maybe, at most, a week. 
And then he's expelled. Where does he go? There's still a famine in the land. There's still a famine in the land of Israel. Famine doesn't, a, a drought doesn't end in a week. Even if there's rain, even if for some miracle there had been an enormous amount of rain, it has, takes a season or two to rebuild the crops. You can't just assume now suddenly there's bread or there's food. So the How can we assume still, that it's a week? Why, where do you get it from? I'm Maybe assuming it's a short period of time because okay. the moment they come down to Mitzrayim, she is taken by Paro, and then Paro expels them. Maybe he didn't notice her right away. Maybe it was their season. Who knows? Okay. Maybe, maybe, but I, 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 I think it's an assumption to, you know, not, to, I, I, to, to I, put I, on a, a, a sin on Abraham. I don't know. Well, no, the, the Ramban says that there's a that, that that's clear. The Ramban says that Abraham made a mistake by going down to Mitzrayim in the first place. That's clear. Ramban says that his going down from the land of Israel to Egypt was a sin. The truth is, if you want an indication that the that the famine is still happening, I'll show it to you. Just look at the next okay. chapter. He comes okay. back to chapter 13, and he comes back to the land of Israel together with Lot, and immediately he's struck by the fact that he comes back from Egypt with cattle, and Lot has cattle, and they're traveling from the south to Bethel, and there's not enough grazing land for the two cattle. Right? That's exactly the issue. There was not enough land to sustain them both. And so they needed to, uh, uh, to, to split up. And when they split up and Abraham said to Lot, let's not fight. The entire land is before us. There isn't enough grazing land. That assumes, I'm assuming that there's a famine still going on. And therefore... You go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. And vice versa. Just understand what this means. Right and left in Tanakh do not mean east and west. In modern maps, all maps face north. So maps right and left are east and west. Biblical frame of reference always faces east. Your map of Israel looks like this. That's your map of Israel. And so right and left from Beit El means if you want the southern part of the land of Israel, what we call the Negev, you go right. And I'll go left, I'll go up to the north. You want the north, right? They were told to leave Egypt. They were forced to leave Egypt. There's still a famine going on. There's not enough grazing land in the, because there's not enough rain. So Abraham says, okay, here's the land of Israel before us. Let's split it. You go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. We'll split the land. What does Lot do? Lot says, oh, you know what? I got a better idea. Let's go back to the text. Lot lifts up his eyes and he sees the plains of Jordan. What is he seeing in the plains of Jordan? The area of Sodom and Amara and, and uh, Adma and Svoim and Soar, which are the five cities of the Rea Kikar, before they are destroyed. And those five cities, the plains of the Kikar, Kigan Hashem Ke'eretz Mitzrayim. They were like the Garden of God, like the land of Egypt. Why? Because, whoops, they are here, either at the bank of the Dead Sea, or more likely on the other side of this uh, of this area. Most scholars put Stoma Amor on the east side of the uh, Dead Sea. I'm sorry for those who uh, like to go visit uh, Mrs. Stum, Mrs. Lot's uh, pillar. Uh, it's not there, actually. It's not accurate. But nonetheless, assuming that it's here on the... That, that's the Abayakika, meaning that what makes it unique, like Jericho today is an oasis in the desert, it was fueled by underground springs, and it had an Egypt-isk characteristic, namely... It was not dependent upon rain. And so Lot chooses to go that direction. And so it's, even though the text tells me, on Sodom, the people of Sodom are evil. But nonetheless, he chooses to go there. And so, then he chose that area. And he traveled eastward. Meaning, Abraham said, right or left, north or south, which part of the country do you want? And he said, I want east. I want out. 
I want to go to where there's a not where there's a, a spring. If I can't go to Egypt, I'll at least go to Sdom Amara, despite the fact that the people of Sdom Amara are evil. And there he settles, and there he marries, and there he has a family, and there he has daughters, and there uh, there he has sons-in-law, and there he has his wife. And so suddenly, later on, when Sodom is destroyed, all of those people are offered to be saved, and Lot has to run for his life. So the chait of Lot, in this regard, says the Gemara, and I'm going to jump back to the source page, when Lot chose to go eastward, says the text, he He was really going beyond the fact that he was going eastward. He was moving away from, playing on the word kedem and kadmon, moving away from the God of Abraham. He was choosing to leave the land of Israel and leave the people of Israel, namely to leave Abraham behind. And that's the key piece in the story. When we get to the destruction of Sodom, and right, who's destroyed in Sodom is Mrs. Sodom, who looks, Mrs. Lot, I should say, who looks backwards to pine for Sodom. Um, the two sons-in-law, who remain behind, and the two daughters who go with Lot, and then, of course, from that union is born whom? Ammon and Moab. Geographically, Ammon and Moab are precisely here on the other side of Yamamelech in the areas of what I would believe to be the areas of the original locations of Sodom and Ammon, because they are replaced, essentially, by Ammon and Moab, are really the descendants, if not physically, even physically, um, genealogically, but also in culture, they are the descendants of Sodom and Amora uh, in that moment. That's the story of Sodom and the story of Lot. Jumping to the other part of this triangle, we have the story of Yehuda. That I think is a little bit too long to go through, but what we do know is that after Yehuda sells Yosef, or tries to sell Yosef, or threatens to sell Yosef, whatever the context is, where he certainly blames himself for the sale of Yosef, you have a very interesting moment where, I'm just going to go to this for a second, Breshit Lamed Zion is the beginning of Pasha Vayeshev and the sale of Yosef, the conflict between Yosef and his brothers, Yuda and Yosef, essentially the two main protagonists. And so Yosef, by the end of this parak, goes down, is sold as a slave, to the Midanim, who sell them to Mitzrayim and to Potiphar. That story should really pick up in chapter 38. Sorry, in 39. We really should pick this up. Next verse should be, the Yosef who had Mitzrayim. Yosef goes down to Mitzrayim. But in between, there's a chapter there that is, At that moment, Yehuda chose to leave his brother and essentially to abandon the household of Israel. I suspect it's more than abandonment. I think it's more a matter of seeing himself, seeing his father's affliction, seeing what he has done to selling Yosef as a slave, essentially to selling Yosef away from the family, into the land of Israel, out of the land of Israel, out of the family of, of Yaakov. He realizes the depth of that crime, and he sort of proclaims upon himself a self-proclaimed exile. And he leaves the land of Israel, and so we have these two stories, Yehuda and Tamar. On the one hand, God running after Yehuda, his wife dies, his sons die. And then, of course, you have the story of Tamar to rehabilitate the family. We'll talk about that another time. And you have th that as a prelude to uh, the back the story of Yehuda and um, of Yosef going down to Egypt. So, without getting into too much of the detail, because I'm I'm rushing through this part because I really want to get to make sure we get to part two. But more or less, what I have in um, right, the two sons of Yehuda who die, um, even though it says that they died because they were evil in the eyes of God, uh, we, there's evidence later on that both Yehuda and the brothers saw the death of Yehuda's two sons as a punishment for Mechirat Yosef, because 
it says that um, later when Reuven makes the argument that if he doesn't bring back Binyamin, may my two sons die if I don't bring you back Binyamin. And Rashi makes the observation that Reuven, and that Yaakov didn't understand what, what, what Reuven was saying. Yaakov says, my, my firstborn is an idiot. What, what, what do you mean? If, I, if, if I, you don't bring back my grandson, I'm going to kill your two sons? That, that makes zero sense. That your sons are not my sons? What, what, how, what kind of, of logic is that? What he doesn't know, or what Yaakov doesn't understand, is that what Reuven was saying to him was, if I don't bring you back Benjamin, then let happen to me what happened to Yehuda's two sons for the sale of Yosef. Because everybody understood that Yehuda's going down, Rashi uses the expression, everybody understood that going down was really a reflection of a kind of a self a proclaimed exile for this moment. So let's come back to Elimelech. Assuming we've set up until now that the Chait of Elimelech was leaving the land of Israel and going to Sodom, sorry, going to Moab, now, leaving Elimelech, leaving land of Israel and going to uh, Moab, abandoning the land of Israel, abandoning the people of Israel, um, then you have a sort of a structure that these three triangles of, on the one hand, Lot, leaving Avraham and leaving the land of Israel, going to Sodom. Yehuda, leaving the household, leaving Yaakov's house, going to, essentially, Eretz Plishtim at that time, but leaving the family of Yaakov, are perceived all in the same triangle, and therefore the same chait, and a little bit also the same punishment. Um, it's fascinating to note, and with this we're going to finish this section of the shir, uh, it's fascinating to note that Elimelech's decision to go to Moab is actually more directly linked to the story of Lot than we would have otherwise thought, because in the Nevi'im, Moab and Ammon, who are not just descendants of Lot, children of Lot, but they are actually the fathers, if you will, of, they are the descendants, if you will, of Sodom and Amorah. Tzvanya makes the reference, Ki Moab ki Amon ka comparing Amon and Moab to Stom Amora. Yeshayao makes the reference that Moab is like a tsar, which is one of the five Kikar. Yechezkel, who describes the sin of Stom. The sin of Stom. What was the sin of Stom? Okay, we know all the Midrashim about the sin of Sodom, but it all comes from this Pasuk in Yechezkel, who says that the sin of Sodom was v'yad ani v'evyon lo hechzika, that they refused to provide any kind of sustenance or support to those of the poor and the needy. And what does the Torah say about Moab and Ammon? That they are, why is it that the Torah says that Ammon and Moab cannot get, enter into the congregation of God for eternity, that they are in a sense outside of the pale of, of potential engagement with the Jewish people, because, says the Torah, because they weren't hospitable to you, because they acted Sdom-like, and because they are descendants of Sdom, they perpetuate the, the mind, the culture of Sdom, that was considered a grave sin. So to put this all together, let's kind of bring it to, together where we're at, According to all that we have stated up until now, this is articulated by the Rambam in the most uh, um, some kind of brief brief uh, summation. He says, It is forbidden to leave the land of Israel to go to a foreign country unless it is to study Torah, to get married, or to, uh, to be saved from the hands of an idolater, or to provide sustenance, livelihood, if you can't make a living in Israel. And that, says the Rambam, is provided you return. The Afopi Shemutar, let's say, and even if it is permissible to leave, says the Rambam, Inamidat Chasidut, it's not praiseworthy. Even in context in which it's permissible, it's not praiseworthy. Why? Shame Machlon Vechilion Shneg Dolea Dora, you Machlon Chilion Ali Melech, great leaders of the generation. 
And they left because of a great distress, a famine. And nonetheless, they were punished by God for that act of abandoning the people and leaving to the land of Moab when the people were suffering the famine in the land. Okay. I'm going to take a brief pause if there are questions one or two i want to make sure we have time for the rest of the sub, the discussion which is part two of the of this year is there a any particular issue related to what i've just said all right the problem with all of this and it's all true and i accept it all the problem is it's missing one link a very critical link because, and we've already established this, when there's a famine in the land of Israel, it's caused by a drought. Where do you go if there's a drought? Where did Abraham go when there was a drought? He went to Egypt, because there's a Nile. Where did Lot go when there was a drought? He went to the Arachikar. Why did he go to the Arachikar? Right? He didn't go to Ammon and Moab. They didn't exist yet. He went to Sodom, Amorath, Sar. Why did he go here? Because, this is before it turned into the, sea, the Dead Sea, because in the Torah it says that there was underground springs that, that, that sustained it even in a time of drought. You go where there's water. Hence the problem. Elimelech is in Beit Lechem. And there's a Ra'av Ba'aretz. There's a famine. If Elimelech went eastward to Egypt, or southward to Egypt, I'd understand. But Elimelech goes to Moab. Why would you go to Moab if there's a famine? If there's a drought here in the land of Israel, likelihood is not a lot of rain in the land of Moab either. Right? You're not going to somewhere where there's rain unless you want to go down to Egypt where there's a Nile. So one of the big mysteries in Mikil Adrut is he goes to Bethlehem, of, uh, he goes to Moab of all places. And then 10 years later, she comes back because she hears, no, Nomi comes back because she hears, Ki Hashem at the nachem. suddenly 10 years later, there's bread. A 10 years, it's a 10 year drought. So, and, and what is there in Moab if it's a 10 year drought in the land of Israel? There's a, there's a piece of the story missing. And so to really put this back together, we need to understand not just the geography of the land and the weather reports, but there's a piece of the story we're not getting. What's that piece of the story? So Chazal articulated in a very interesting way. Ask the question, when did this story take place? Can we pinpoint the time frame of Megillat Rut? The answer is, what are you going to do? It says, all it says is, in the days of the judges. That doesn't give me a lot of information to go on. How long is the time period of the time of the judges? The whole period of Sefer Shoftim. It's about 400 years. 400 years. years. 400. 400 years. Yeah, 400 years. So 400 years, Megillat Rut Shoftim doesn't tell me a lot. Number one. Number two, Vayira Av Baaretz, there's a famine in the land, ostensibly caused by a lack of water, by a drought. In all of Megillat, in all of Sefer Shoftim, and I've taught Sefer Shoftim several times, in all of Sefer Shoftim, there is no reference to a drought. There's distress, all kinds of distress, but there's no reference to a drought. We'll have to see what that means. Number two. Number three, who is the leader of the people in Beit Lechem? who sits by the gate of the city, who gathers the elders to the city, who is the head of the Sanhedrin, clearly enough to be able to articulate new halachas about, about Moab, uh, acceptance of Moab, by women into conversion, right? Who is the leader of the people at that time? Boaz. Boaz. Boaz is not mentioned anywhere in Sefer Shoftim. So Chazal does something fascinating. They give us two reference points to see if we can pinpoint when this story took place. What are they? I'll show you what they are. Two reference points. And again, in classic Midrashic language, everything's coded. So we have to decode it. The first reference point, point is 
that when it <laughs> says shvot shoftim, it doesn't just it doesn't just mean the time when the judges sat and ruled, right? Shvot shoftim, but it means bimei shvot hashoftim, when the judges were judged. Okay, how does that come to be? Says the Gemara, Dor sheshofet et shoftav, a generation that judged its own judges. If a judge would say to somebody, Tol kesami ben inecha, take the splinter from between your eyes, they would respond and say, sorry, me, that should be mi ben shenecha. There's a typo. Take the, not a typo, it's a, a girsa issue, but it, take the, the splinter, the, the toothpick out from between your teeth, mi ben shenecha, it should say, omer lo, the response would be, Tol kuram mi ben inecha, remove the beam from between your eyes. Who are you to judge us? Who are you to tell us what to do? Okay? We know any period of time in which the judges were treated as if, who were you to tell me what to do? Yeah, a lot of a lot of time was like that. But what essentially the Gemara is suggesting is that if you look through Sefer Shoftim, find the low point, find the nadir, find the point in which, from whatever context, historically, geographically, culturally, socially, religiously, find the lowest point of the book, and more or less, that's where you're going to find this story. It's not like Pilegish Begiva. Oh, so Pilegish Begiva, maybe there's a lot of, there's a uh, book by Yael Ziegler on, on, on um, Megillah Ruch. She does a lot of comparison to the story of Pilegish Begiva. The story with Pilegish Begiva is that we have no, the, the problem there is we have no time frame for it. There's no Shofet. Uh, there's no Shofet in that story. And so it's a hard story to put into this context. Uh, I'm going to go somewhere else for the, in this in a moment. The other reference is Boaz, Boaz in Bethlehem. If Boaz has a Shofet-like rule, he is leader, he is, in, et cetera, gathers the elders. Is there any other Shofet in Bethlehem? And the answer is yes. There's a Shofet by the name of Iftsan. And so the Gemara says, Iftsan is Boaz. We see in Shoftim Paragid Beth that, that uh, Yiftzan is Shofet. It comes right after Yiftach. We'll talk about that in a second. Yiftzan of Bethlehem. He ruled for seven years, and he's buried in Bethlehem. So if I have two frames of reference, a low point in Sefer Shoftim for the story to take place, and some identification of the connection between Boaz and the only Shofet of Bethlehem at the time, namely Yiftzan, Okay, so Chazal, that's enough to pinpoint these two points of reference. Okay? So what does that tell me? Here's, let me close this, I don't need that anymore. Okay, here's a list of all of the Shoftim, in the, the book of Shoftim in the land of Israel. You can see they're spread out throughout the land. One of the characteristics of the book of Shoftim is that more or less each Shofet came from a different geographic area. You almost have no two shoftim in the entire book listed from the same location. The whole idea of the book of shoftim is that it's decentralized leadership. Unlike a melech, where you have one central national leader, that's the foundational difference between a shofet and a melech, here you have decentralized, every shofet came from a different region. Right? The Gemara actually makes this reference and says that every, every tribe provided a shofet. And so there's only one in Bethlehem, and that's Yivtzan. Can you make the Can you make it bigger so we can read? Um, I can try. Does that work? Yes, thank you. Okay, Yivtzan of Bethlehem. Now, that doesn't, how does that help me? So it helps me from two perspectives. And in the time we have, we're going to see if we can unpack this. We may not finish it. We may have to do this part of this next week. So I apologize if we kind of have to bridge that, but this is a very important piece. I'm going to walk you through some of the charts that I had created when I once, uh, when I taught Sefer Shoftim. I'm going to skip this text for a second. Here's a simple chart that is a summary of the entire book of Shoftim. This chart makes it, basically gives you a picture of the entire period of the 400 years of the book of Shoftim. There are 13 different Shoftim mentioned in the book. I've divided them into two groups because you can see from the number of years that they led, 
reigned, led, judged, right, however you want to define it, that in the first five, they reigned for or led for 40 years or 80 years or 40 years or 40 years. There's a certain round number of a generation context, right? Abim Shanat Kutbador. Otniel ben Knaz, Eil ben Geber, Shemgar ben Enat, we don't know a lot about, Devora and Barak, Gidon ben Yoash, or Yerubal, each one of them more or less for 40 years. The latter part of the Shoftim, more or less, we know very little about them. Their stories get very brief, and they reign for odd number of years. Avimelech is Bechlal, a whole different story. Uh, he's not even really a Shofet. He reigns for three years. He tries to assert himself as a king. He tries to kill everybody in Shechem. Very complex story. Tola ben Pua doesn't say anything about him except that he reigned for 23 years. Ya'ir Giladi, 22 years. Yiftach, 6 years. Iftzan, 7 years. Elon is 10 years. Avdon ben Ilel, 8 years. If you've never heard of these people, it's because there's nothing there. There's a couple of verses about a story. And then, of course, Shimshon, who is um, in Eretz Pushtim. If I put the story of Yiftach, sorry, let me do that again. If I put the story of Boaz, when Naomi comes back from Moab to the land of Israel, to Bethlehem, and there she finds Boaz, and Chazal link Boaz to Iftsan, well, Iftsan was a shofet for seven years. How long was Naomi in the land of Moab? At least? Ten years? Ten years, mm-hmm. right? Because it says that it was ten years. Which means that if, if Tzan is, is Boaz, when they come back to Bethlehem, more or less ten years takes us to, if Yiftach, the previous Shofet, ruled for six years, it puts us in the time frame pre-Yiftach. Not yet to get your ability in between, because in the 18 years prior to Yiftach's reign, they were under the oppression of the, the uh, forces of Ammon who would come in and wage war with them. And so it was Yiftach who eventually led the war against Ammon to free the people of that oppression. So in the 18 years prior to Yiftach's war with Ammon, and then his reign for six years, more or less that's the time frame Chazal are using to put the story of Elimelech. Okay? That's the question. Now, that's one reference. There was another reference, right? That, the other one was Dor Shishoftu at Shoftav, generation that judged the judges. So what's that about? So for that, we need to go back to Sefer Shoftu. And this is the chapter that begins the story of Yiftach. Okay, Yiftach begins actually Perak Yud Aleph. Perak Yud Aleph or Yiftach HaGiladi. The previous Perak just before Yiftach is the background to Yiftach. Um, I'm going to share with you information that I, I can't prove to... Oh, it's one o'clock. We're going to run out of time. All right, we're going to pick this up from next week, what we need to do is we need to figure out, and and what it might mean is that I might have to dedicate next week's year at least the first half of it to this question because it's very important. Um, so I'm going to steal the topic of next week, and we're going to push all the topics down one week. We'll combine two of them together. Um, I, I really, it's very important to understand how Yiftach and the war with Amon plays a role. In the background, to, I'm going to stop sharing. Actually, it's very important to see how Yiftach and his war with Ammon plays a role in the story of Ruth and Elimelech. So, just to summarize what we did today, so we looked at what I would call the classic or traditional approach to the book of Ruth, which is to see Elimelech as one of the leaders of the generation leaves the land of Israel, abandons his brethren, abandons the people, goes to Chutzlaretz, in parallel to Lot abandoning Abraham and abandoning the land of Israel, going to Chutzlaretz, in parallel to Yehuda, 
abandoning his brothers, abandoning Yaakov, essentially declaring upon himself the kind of punishment that Yosef, that he put, that he put Yosef into, meaning self-proclaimed exile. And in that context, Ali Melech is punished, and the courage that Naomi has to return is essentially 10 years later, she hears that the famine is over, she decides to come back. What we started to explore, which we haven't finished, is well, that works, except for the fact that they go to Moab and not Egypt. And if the Ra'av is a famine, then they should be going where there's water, which, was, which would be Egypt. The fact that they're going to Moab tells me that there's more to this famine than meets the eye. So for that, we need to look at the historical context. And we began to explore Dor Sheshavtu Shoftab, the low point of Sefer Shoftim, and the connection between Boaz and Beit Lechem. And we're narrowing our focus down to the period of time just prior to Yiftach. But that doesn't tell us anything yet, because we need to figure out what's going on in this period of time prior to Yiftach and how that plays a role in the rest of the story. I have 30 seconds left if anybody has any questions. I mean, Great pull question. the chain. There's another point uh, at the end. It tells you that Boaz is the grandfather of Yishai. That gives you a rough idea. Yes, that, that is true. The only reason why I don't think that that helps us as far as I mean, it helps us a little bit. It does tell us that we're we're on the right track because from a generational, from a time perspective, Yiftach is about 300 years into the period of Shoftim. And so there's about 50... Again, the, the numbers are off a little bit because it's hard to pinpoint it. But we're uh, 100 years before the end of, of the book of Shoftim. Um, the period of Shaul and Shmuel is very is very complicated as far as uh, chronology goes, but we're not far. It works in terms of the gene the genealogy. Genealogy lists in Tanakh aren't always the ideal solution or ideal um, tool because they sometimes skip generations, like by Mordechai, Mordechai ben Yair ben Shimi ben Kish. Right? There's a lot of generations skipped, but yes, in theory. The uh, that would also help us and would put us in the same time period. Yeah, somebody's raising it. Oh, when uh, when you say that, that we're drawing the parallels between um, Yehuda and Tamar and um, losing um, and and children were left, their children were left uh, bereft of their uh, spouses. Um, the Benos Lot were the unmarried ones. They were the ones that were offered to the mob in Sodom. It's, uh, I'm not sure I agree that they were the ones who were unmarried. It doesn't tell us who they are. But uh, the time frame is also, um, but there's sons-in-law who are negotiated with and they refuse to, stay, to, to go with. So um, it could be that they're the unmarried ones, but it would still come from the same uh, context. The, the, the first ones who destroyed are the ones who are the Sodomites who remain behind. We have to get to the story of why the daughters of Lot thought that they needed to do what they needed to do. I, I, there's a Yibum component there in the restoration of Sodom, uh, but we haven't gotten to that part of the story yet. So I'm going to hold on that as well. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thank you I'd very much. I'd just like to observe yes. that the map you showed of the tribes had three tribes east of the Jordan River, yeah. north of Moab. And the only reason they don't extend down through Moab is because God tells Moshe, you can't conquer Moab because they're relatives and therefore. So... Right. All of the tribe, but why Why were those three tribes, or two and a half, pardon me, why were they east of the Jordan River? All right, so let me, let me separate out two, two things here. And we'll get to this in detail next week. Um, Reuben, God, and half of Manasseh are on the east side of the river because that's where they belong. The area conquered from Sichon, which was the area between the Anun River and the Abok, was given to Reuven and Gad. Menashe was always destined to be in the area of the Bashan and, and the Gilad. 
that's a whole different shear. We can talk about that. Um, the request of Reuven and God it was supposed to have Shimon included in that group, and um, that that didn't happen because of Baal Pa'or. Your question really highlights a different issue, which is the location of Moab. All right, and the reason why it's relevant, I'm just going to share this for one second. Um, let's see if I kept that map up. Um, yeah, this is this is the what you're talking about. This area between the Anon River and the Yabok River is the area given to Reuven and God. Moab south of it. But that's only because you're looking at a map of the period of the Shoftim. When I'm talking about Lot and the framework of Lot's dome and therefore the birth of Mammon and Moab, this doesn't exist. Moab, as we'll see next week, is between the Arnon River and the Yabok. That's the land of Moab. That land was conquered by Sichon before we ever came to that region. We conquered it from Sichon, and therefore we hold on to it. That's a big part of the conversation with Yiftach. So all of that will become the conversation next week. My note Look. had nothing to do with that. My note was about your contention about water. They're there because there is water there somehow. It's the best place for for flocks, for okay, flocks gonna, of sheep. You can't okay. have flocks of sheep without water. Makes no sense. I I I hear. Um, let's let's raise that next week and we'll see where where it goes. All right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful thank day. Shukur, yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. My thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm available if anyone wants to hang on, hang out and chat. How long, how long after Naomi found out that the famine is gone, did she decide to go back? And doesn't she have some responsibility for not, not trying to get her sons to go back? Uh, yeah. after all, all of that, out? all of that to be, all of those are good questions and we will explore them all. Okay, thank you. No problem. Your, your share on Pesach, where is God in the, in, uh, during Pesach was beautiful. It thank was you very beyond. much. Appreciate that. I really uh, appreciated it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that too. All right. Where, where do you get your maps? Um, for maps most of them, most of them, I pull off of. I mean, I used to get them out of the Das Mikra Tanakh. Now they're much more readily accessible on that same website that I use called AllahTorah.org. A lot of chapters in Tanakh will have a map associated with it, so that's usually the easiest way to do it. I'm learning to how to use it. Thank you. Yeah, AllahTorah is a great website. Thank you. My pleasure. All the best.